Welcome back to European Space Flight Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Parsonson. Today, I'm excited to welcome Space Cargo and Limited CEO, Nicholas Goma. Nicholas, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Would you mind starting off a bit by telling me about Space Cargo and Limited and the company's goals? Sure. Thank you so much for having me, Andrew. So Space Cargo and Limited started its journey pretty much eight years ago. Uh, my co-founder, Emmanuel Etchepa, and myself were very passionate entrepreneurs. Uh, in fact, both him and I have been in multiple fields mostly in tech, uh, always trying to look at, at uh, how we could create impact with science, innovation, and disruptive technology. And we've all been passionate and inspired by space. And looking at all the amount of research done on the International Space Station, we realized that there was a vast amount of opportunities lying into uh, microgravity um, in space manufacturing all up. And these research have been and are conducted uh, on a regular basis. I mean, basically, that's what the astronauts do on the space station every day. And so we become extremely intrigued and excited on how and why it didn't become more uh, of a thing, just because it was, in obvious terms, looking at the, the research, extremely uh, exciting potential for impactful product back on Earth. And looking into a specific set of opportunities, we decided to do a first mission of our own, uh, which was focused on agriculture and more specifically viticulture. Uh, we had three flights um, that we conducted between uh, 20 and 20, well, 2019, late 2019 and 2020. That's an overall mission that started in 2000 and late 2015. And, and basically today we're seeing the first uh, positive outcome of that research mission. And in, among the multiple flights, we flew a bottle of wines, we flew uh, vine plants. And these vine plants specifically uh, got challenged by the absence of gravity in the environment of the space station and developed certain properties that make them more resilient to climate change stresses, which was the goal that we were pursuing. And that was really a very effective demonstration in our mind that that microgravity was an amazing opportunity for for multiple products and along the journey we flew with a uh, nasa isa um, spacex blue origin uh, we also saw all the hurdles that uh, it takes to go from an idea to an actual execution project and outcomes and you know across these multiple years we established as early as 2015 that we would want to have uh, our own capacity of um, in space manufacturing uh, platform uh, we realized that one of the biggest obstacle was uh human on board and basically when you're on the international space station humans put an amazing amount of constraints on anything that is really non-essential to their support and their life and it's kind of obvious that uh, if there's an issue with an astronaut uh, life you will sacrifice these plants or new materials or anything you'll be doing so we started thinking about uh, a self-sustainable automated vehicle for you a free flyer looked at multiple options, and then he ended up uh, working with Thales Alenia Space on the project we unveiled uh, very recently, Rev1. Yeah, I mean, that, that Rev1 has obviously uh, given you a lot of headlines uh, over the last few weeks since your announcement. Um, the concept, I mean, is obviously the first thing that you notice about the Rev1 concept is that it is uh, very uh, similar in, in its appearance to the ESA Space Rider vehicle. Um, how much of the vehicle of Space Rider are you using, uh, and how is it that you you are able to use that uh, leverage that technology? So you know, in in many ways, we 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 believe uh, just just to be completely grounded. Our our perspective is is that there's really a um, multi-purpose vehicle are hard, and and we truly believe that being dedicated makes a huge difference. Uh, so one of the key principle when we started was we want to be focused on in-space manufacturing and testing and make sure that all the, the vehicle is geared towards the efficacy in that domain. Uh, that means we are very grounded into uh, anything from the structure, the, the, the way we're going to manage shock down to the subsystems, the heat management, the power supply. So everything is extremely grounded into uh, in-space manufacturing. So we have a deep knowledge in agriculture and biology in general, and life science is arguably one of the most exciting opportunity that we can seize with, with, um, with, with microgravity and, and space in general. New materials is equally exciting. Um, and so we, we designed really the specs from the subsystems before we designed the vehicle. Then we looked at a variety of vehicles uh, in, in different areas, different countries. Uh, we ended up look, stumbling because we were working with Thales Anya Space, who was a partner of uh, Mission Wise, our, our mission on agriculture and viticulture. So we've known them for now six years and worked intensively with them. They did actually all the canister in partnership with Nanoracks in the US that, that uh, got our bottles uh, to fly to the ASS. 
Um, and so <clears throat> as we worked with, with Thales, they, they unveiled what they did with IXV to begin with. So IXV was a vehicle that flew uh, pretty much eight years ago, funded by uh, the uh, uh, European Space Agency and, and largely the Italian Space Agency. And, and that really showed a lot of exciting technology, for instance, re-entry shield, which, which as you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a challenging uh, component. Um, and then we discovered Space Rider. So our first inclination was, was to look at how we could operate Space Rider. But Space Rider is a very powerful multi-purpose vehicle, which have an ability to, to pool an entire ecosystem. I mean, uh, Avio and Thales and Space are the co-prime on this project. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we looked into the way we could leverage a Space Rider and eventually we decided to go into a, a more very narrowly specific version that would be uh, geared towards our, our specific purpose of in-space manufacturing. And that's how Rev1 was born. So we basically working with Thales, they're providing key piece of technology that they developed for AXV and Space Rider. Uh, in that sense, we really, uh, 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 you know, uh, we exist because of ESA leadership. We exist before or because of the Ag uh, Italian Space Agency leadership. Uh, and that's that's really something that is uh, interesting to to point out because I think that people always say, you know, a lot of things happen in America. Well, we believe uh, Europe has much to offer, amazing entrepreneurs, amazing engineering technology, knowledge and expertise. And I think that that's really the kind of interesting dynamic we hope to be able to, to demonstrate. So again, being focus on in-space manufacturing, being fabulous was also something super important to us because we feel that we have very specific skill set that we wanted to use. So we're going to be really managing mostly the key subsystems uh, that, that are critical to the in-space manufacturing process or lab. But, you know, uh, we, we very much feel that we don't need to reinvent the wheel when there's so much great technology and work that has been done. So we are indeed using the same uh, structural approach. And certainly we have a lot of differences when it comes to uh, uh, many things, you know, for instance, we have a in orbit uh, service module that will provide power, whereas a space rider has its own uh, Avum and it's 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 pretty much uh, uh, new for every mission. And, and when you look into the very details, there's a lot of difference, which we'll be happy to unveil as we developed, uh, we will share more publicly uh, the details of our vehicle. But we are indeed leveraging the existing program. We're making something very specific of our own. And as far as we're concerned, we really wanted to focus on, on the critical subsystems rather than start from scratch for the entire construct. Yeah, I mean, you talked about that that service module. Um, obviously, that's one of the key differences is because you're not launching with that service module. From what I understand from the videos, you're going to be docking um, in orbit with that service module. Um, I'm guessing it's launched separately. Is it going to be a reusable service module? Is it going to be consistently in orbit that it can be re reused multiple times? And Absolutely. If, it, if it is, is it going to be refueled uh, by uh, your your Rev One concept, or is there another way to to refuel it? No, it'll, it'll stay in orbit. So we'll launch it once and use it. We we anticipate we have twenty flights for a vehicle. Uh, and we anticipate the, the service module long to last as long as possible. We're in phase one development of this particular uh, module. So we, we expect to have um, obviously more specs to unveil and, and to share, but it is really uh, one of the key approach. We wanted to have enough power and optimize cost. And that was arguably the, the, the best uh, path for us with, with, the, uh, with the construct that we chose to, uh, to, um, to embrace. Yes. You alluded to those 20 flights. Uh, that was definitely one of the, the more striking things about your announcement because I think Space Riders um, set at six flights. They're looking at six flights uh, reusability at the moment, and you've obviously pumped that up from six to 20. Um, what is uh, the key differences between the two vehicles that allows you to, to reuse it that many times? Um, and in terms of refurb refurbishment, how much of the vehicle uh, will you have to change throughout its life? I mean, after the first mission, you probably won't have to change a lot, but from one to 20, will a significant portion of the vehicle be uh, updated or changed? Yes, you know, and, and it's it's certainly, uh, there's two two elements to answer your questions. First of all, it's a new vehicle. Obviously we're leveraging the heritage, but it is a new vehicle. So we're changing a lot of, uh, of you know, a lot of components that 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 really will, affect uh, the reusability. And, and it's also, you know, probably uh, the type of obsession that we have coming from tech startups and having done, uh, you know, seven of them before uh, starting Space Cargo. I've always looked into what every software developer or every uh, tech developer does, really, which try to be able to leverage uh, what you have and, and build upon what you have. So again, with the idea of being fabulous and specifically focused on in-space manufacturing, it was critical for us to really rethink um, the um, 
all interior and, and, and structure it in such a way that we could have a little more modularity. Uh, so certainly uh, in terms of also, we have pressurized cargo, it's critical to us. So we also approach quite differently uh, the way we built um, our, 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 our payload uh, uh, infrastructure. Now, to get back to another point, it's also a program that we're developing with the utmost rigor, but we're not uh, certainly at the level of, a, let's say, agency, uh, uh, you know, absolute demands. And I think it's exciting that that uh, that the agencies pull the technology and the industrial knowledge to the to the top so we can be more specific on where we want to put uh, the the um, let's say the the, the specific demands. Um, I'll, I'll be clear, we feel that there are a number of things that, that we could approach a little more in a more, uh, let's say, creative way, again, geared towards results rather than looking at an absolute engineering perfection, which, which is an endless quest. So, you know, you have to set where you start in terms of efficacy, in terms of safety, in terms of rigor. Uh, and, and if you go into absolute terms and never think about how it's going to be used, how and how and what's the impact on the cost of the mission, on the efficacy of the, the goal you're pursuing, you end up with a lot of limitation. So we try to free ourselves from uh, absolute uh, limitation to be very grounded into um, outcomes of the missions and, and safety, security, and rigor. And then you realize there's many things you can do in that, in that context. Perfect. Uh, in terms of, of funding, uh, you've obviously stated that you're currently raising funds for phase one. Um, what exactly does phase one entail? Is that uh, no, a design so phase? We, we, we didn't say that. We, we actually, uh, basically one of the things, and that actually also will have uh, complementary elements to the previous question you asked me. Um, I think that what is ex exciting about this partnership with Thales is really the Again, the industrial power, the the the, the knowledge, the leadership of Thales, with certainly an obsession for outcomes, a result, a focus, a go-to-market expertise that we bring. So the combination of these two things makes, I believe, a very strong partnership. Particularly as again, we've been working with Thales and Yes Space for close to six years. So we have, we have really ex you know we have a really experienced many things together, and and we really work well together. Um, and one of the key outcome was the financial model, the business model. Uh, basically, today, a company like Thales and others are working in, 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 the, in the current constructs get, uh, you know, commissioned to build as prime, co-prime, a vehicle. They receive a budget uh, and basically they, they spend time and, and, and energy to, to fulfill what they're being paid for. We thought it would be interesting to have a different approach. And if I can sum it up, uh, Thales and in your space will make more money with our vehicle Potentially, although it's going to be very much done in a, in a, in a, in more alignment with the outcomes and the performance of the vehicle. So instead of paying everything up front, we're going to pay. We are paying, <laughs> to be clear, uh, while also working together on on the, the the operational opportunity. It's something that is very common in the uh, in the airplane uh, manufacturing setup. You know, basically the way you build an engine is you you make sure that as an engine manufacturer, you're going to really uh, uh, look after the maintenance and make sure the performance is long lasting. So aligning with very key goals of reusability of performance that we set up with our partners, we will be able to, to pay uh, based to the outcome, effective outcomes. And basically, besides being a manufacturing organization, Thales and Space will also be co-running the garage and the service and the maintenance with us, which means that, you know, maybe instead of getting 100, they will get 120, 130. Instead of getting it once at the beginning, it will be spread among the, the, the multi years of, of operations and collaborations. So I think everybody wins uh, more revenue, a diversified opportunity for, 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 for Thales. We are, on the other hand, managing our financial needs in a, in a, in a smarter way. It's also get us to be able to go sooner than later in, in, in a dialogue with our customers, because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is the, uh, the ability to satisfy customer demands. So that's really uh, the way we build our construct, which means that then the financial requirement is different. So phase one gets us to the ability to start manufacturing with all the very specific uh, uh, you know, blueprints and, and production uh, set up. Uh, we are uh, really well uh, well engaged on, on this dynamic. We have uh, exciting new opportunities from, from, from customers. A little less in space manufacturing, a little more in, in space testing. Uh, we are providing a very exciting IOD, IOV uh, platform for, for multiple uh, space stakeholders. And, you know, it's it's also a moment in space. You cover it very well in Europe, which, which is a very exciting moment of change, which we're 
finding our own way and our own path, uh, leveraging what we saw has been successful in, in the United States of America, uh, finding their own specific uh, way of doing things that is related to the European construct. So again, not to be uh, too long in my response, and I probably have been, um, a different uh, business constructs first means different financial requirements, and then a combination of um, capital raised, uh, obviously some debt, equity, uh, and, 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 and funding uh, attached to the equity, uh, and more importantly, a dialogue with the customers and funding from the customers sooner than later. Perfect. It makes us be able to. Fair enough. But as you said, it, it was quite an involved answer. In terms of brass tax, from now until the launch of your first vehicle in 2025, which is your current target, are you funded all that way, or will there be in terms of that business model that you've discussed? No, they'll, that? They'll, well, there'll be other funding. We, we okay. you know, it's also a combination of of the way you set up things. Also, it's also the the, the people you choose to work with. So I'm talking about specific investors. Uh, Euraseo, uh, which is our lead investor, have been with us from the very beginning of that journey. Uh, Benoit Grossman, who is one of the managing partner and an amazing uh, leader, is, sits on our boards and brings his, his leadership and support. He participates through every single round we've done. We're very fortunate to have uh, Karine Courtin, who I announced the, the, the vehicle with uh, last week in, in that new Space Europe conference. Uh, and Karine has been very engaged. She has, she has both an entrepreneurial background as much as, a, as an amazing um, uh, let's say technological uh, approach and, and, and knowledge, and then we have Charles Bigbede, who's a very well known and highly regarded entrepreneur that has started a, a space fund expansion. He's, re he's raising funds, and as he's closing his fund, as as Razo is continuing to invest, we have partners that are really uh, dedicated to the space uh, sector and certainly uh, very engaged uh, with us. So the truth is. They have a presence, liquidity, they're on our board. So you can imagine that's also a component that makes the, the funding uh, much, much more, uh, let's say, manageable than if you were just starting from, from scratch, right? Yeah. In terms, you, you spoke about customers um, and uh, your early engagement with customers, and you're already en engaging with potential customers for Rev1. Um, have you got any sorts of uh, memorandums of understandings with customers that are, are keen to fly, or is that still uh, all those conversations still in, in a very early stage? No, we have we have quite mature conversation with with a few uh, of our partners and sectors. We also have a number of of uh, documentation that is supporting these engagements. Um, to be completely clear, we are finalizing the very specific KPIs that will allow us to have specific elements that are critical in any uh, customer commitment, which really downs to cost, uh, you know, and, 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 and service and uh, SLAs, uh, you know, so we really want to make sure that uh, we do things in the right order. Uh, we have enough intent uh, to be excited about the vehicle, uh, and otherwise we wouldn't have done it, you know, or announced it. Uh, we will complete uh, pretty soon, actually, um, the, uh, the the specific KPIs that need to to form, firm up all the maiden flights uh, uh, support and participant. So, you know, everything is moving really uh, well ahead of our plans and we're really excited. Um, I'll add to this that, uh, yes, we are continuing to look for customers. So if anybody's interested, it's also a, a market maturity. I think that if you look at things, space, um, uh, you know, in space manufacturing has been the underdog of new space for quite a while. It's been set as early as the 70s. That's the great next revolution. It never really took off for a combination of reasons, but the main two ones are launch cost. Obviously it was too expensive to really uh, launch anything, any payload and manufacturing setup that would really make exciting outcomes, but way too expensive. Now with uh, launch cost going down, that becomes a much more interesting compelling value prop. And then, you know, a dedicated platform. We really think that, as I said, humans and multi-purpose vehicle will not unlock the potential of in-space manufacturing. Of course, you can do in-space manufacturing, in-space research with a multi-purpose vehicle or human on boards. It can be of interest. And we truly believe that space station brings a lot of opportunity to do research and, and, and find new outcomes. But when it comes to producing at scale and really doing the kind of uh, quality manufacturing process you would expect from the next last generation of, of factory. There's so much you can't do on on, on multi-purpose vehicle or with, with platform uh, having human on board. And the minute you have a platform that is accessible at the right cost, then you generate new usage, new opportunities. And if I take, you know, a simple analogy that everybody understands, 
there were apps on mobile phone before the iPhone. Uh, you know, the old Nokia and, and, and Sony Ericsson uh, phones had apps. They were very difficult to find, they're very difficult to download, to, to use. And when Apple released the iPhone, there were four apps. Now there are thousands of apps. It's 100 billion uh, euros of, of market because the platform allowed to break down the cost of entry, uh, make efficacy distribution, put reliable service. And in a way, that's exactly what we aim, aim to do with this uh, in-space manufacturing platform, this space factory uh, that Rev1 is. And we tend to hope that um, the combination of market maturity, the outputs we'll be sharing on, on the specific details of our vehicle, along with the, the first customer we'll announce, will drive the, the further funding uh, support that uh, we'll get from our existing shoulders and potentially new shoulders we will uh, will be uh, excited to work with. In terms, I mean, launch costs, obviously, as you pointed out, is a, is a huge uh, hurdle to, to anything that you do in orbit. Um, have you started to look at, at launch vehicles? I mean, I would assume that Vegas C is, is the most obvious choice, considering that uh, the, the technology you're leveraging is already designed for Vegas C. Is that something you're looking at? And are you looking at other vehicles? That's very true. Uh, you're absolutely right. And we really, uh, are, you know, I said we were fabulous. I said we were fast, very dedicated to space manufacturing. We're also very European. Um, our headquarters in Luxembourg, uh, most of our research uh, and development that we've done on our, uh, on our uh, first mission, Mission Wise, is done out of France. Or our technical leadership is is in Germany, is from, is from Germany, they work in Luxembourg. Um, with pre with great great leaders coming from uh, Airbus Defense and Space, and now we're really investing ourselves massively into Italy. We're very imp impressed, very inspired by Italian ecosystem. I think they they've been on the cutting edge of, of frontier technology that are now becoming super critical to all the bold ambition to uh, to go to uh, to the next chapter of, of the of the space uh, journey. Uh, so we are totally totally excited to to engage with the, all the great leaders of Italy. Avio is a company we highly respect, and, and we're very excited to, to start uh, looking into uh, the, the, the maiden flight setup. As, 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 as it is, our vehicle will be able to fly with any launcher. We made sure it was, because again, at the end of the day, our focus is in space manufacturing. It's not uh, uh, you know, launching rockets for the sake of launching rockets. So for sure, Vegas a is, a, is a absolutely a natural uh, launch vehicle for us. Uh, we really want to be a supporter of the Italian ecosystem, but we open to any other launch uh, launcher that could uh, support the, the roughly uh, 2.5 tons uh, vehicle that we have. The good news is that we are a little more flexible on a number of other parameters. So it, it makes us, I think, an interesting uh, you know, partner and customer for a lot of these uh, upcoming contenders. So to be continued, and I know you track this this particularly well, so we'll be happy to talk more about this uh, sometime soon. Perfect. In terms of, uh, you talked about that maiden flight, obviously you're targeting 2025, which sounds incredibly ambitious from the announcement of a vehicle in 2022 to the launch of the flight in 2025. Obviously you said that you have worked on this vehicle for many years before your first announcement. So is this launch date as ambitious as it sounds? It is ambitious, no doubt. And I say late 25, not early 25 to begin <laughs> with. Uh, we And again, we're leveraging an, an existing program that started with XV, that continues space router. So it is obviously uh, what also makes us be able to, to go faster to completion, no doubt. Perfect. I mean, thank you for joining me for this conversation, Nicholas. I, I really appreciate it. I think a, a lot of people are looking for some, some details on Rev1 and I know personally that this was a very illuminating conversation. So thank you so much for joining me um, and I eagerly await uh, the maiden flight of Rev1. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Perfect. Uh, thank you for joining me for my rambling conversations with interesting people. Keep an eye on my social media and your favorite podcast service for the next episode. Until then, remember, it's a beautiful day for launching Europe.